This here is the Trian Chief Little Wolf from the First Nations who want to speak to you and say some things. His Indian name is Okungache, which should be rather translated with Little Coyote. Little Wolf lived from 1820 till 1904 and lived in the Black Hills of South Dakota and the Lame Deer Reserve in Montana. He belonged to the Himove Yuki tribe inside the Cheyenne Nation and was the spiritual incarnation of Sweet Medicine, the spiritual ancestor of the Cheyenne. Well, let's hear what Chief Little Wolf wants to say to us now in the year 2013. My name is Little Wolf and I come from the Cheyenne Indians. I'm talking to to you today through the mouth of a lady who I once spent a lifetime with back in the 1800s. I speak to her on a regular base and I also speak through her on a regular base. We are old enemies and we are old friends. As all people have once upon a time perhaps been enemies and perhaps once upon a time they have been the dearest of friends. The reason I want to speak about this today is to speak about friendship to speak about what friendship really means and what people mean to each other. Because what we seem to find across the nations of America is that there's been so much hatred, so much bloodshed and so many problems which have been caused by those who don't have anything actually to do with us that have actually broken the will of the American Red Man. There are probably also a few of you listening now who are really wondering if this woman is actually bringing through my voice. But I can assure you that I am. And if any of you are clever enough to be able to channel yourselves, then you will understand that this lady is actually bringing me through. I was with the Cheyenne natives in the 1800s. I was one of their chiefs. We were attached to the Lakotas. We lived along the Cheyenne River, but we spent most of our lives in hiding in those years. We had a lot to do with a lot of other of the Native American Indians, particularly the Apaches. The Apache warriors from the south were quite a dangerous bunch, and a few of them turned on us a few times, which seems to happen all over the world at the moment. We see brothers turning on brothers, and we see sisters turning on sisters. And we of the nations have become tired of this, and we of the nations would like to call for peace. But before we call for peace, I think we need to call for the wolf tribe to come back. As a wolf myself, I think you understand the concept of the wolf tribe if you have anything to do with the American natives. <clears throat> the wolves themselves actually come out of a very generous and beautiful surroundings. They are a pack of animals who actually have honor they are a breed of creatures who actually live in simplicity and they are of the gentlest of natures unless you touch their families. This is exactly what we are like. There are many of us in America who are waiting for the call for the wolves. And when the wolf call comes, I can assure you that there are many American natives who are waiting to take up arms again. I only hope this time that it will be a peaceful movement that we won't have any more of our crosses to bear, if you understand the pun of what I mean by bearing or maybe even wearing a cross. I don't think any of us want to wear crosses anymore. I don't think we ever did. I don't think we ever wanted any of the bishops to rule in our particular cities. I don't think we had to watch our women slain and murdered, our children raped and brutalized. Neither did we have to watch the cornfields that were red with poppy seeds or your corn from the south. I tell you there's a lot of corn and cotton. Cotton fields in the south were usually red poppy fields. The poppy fields had an awful lot to do with the problems in America. I think you all know that poppy is part of the base element when we come into making some drugs. We can bring in opium. We can actually do some good with it if we need it when people have been harmed or endangered. But when we sell these drugs around the world, going through Havana, straight into Amsterdam's ports, which is what they were doing in the 1700s, then we understand where most of the drug trading came out of in those years. 
The lady speaking knows nothing of this. She is only moving my words. But I can assure anyone that's listening here today that Havana was a very large drugs capital, as was Amsterdam, as Amsterdam still is, as most of you know. And most of this went out of the southern ports of Louisiana. The southern gentlemen enjoyed very much their drug trafficking. It made them all very rich. I think you've seen the beautiful estates they used to live on and the slave trades that they had. Most of the slaves were bought with money from drug trafficking and most of the drug traffickers actually came out of the South. But that's not to say that a Mr. Washington didn't also have one of those rather large beautiful houses with a few slaves. I even believe he had some red fields but I don't think many people who understand who Mr. Washington was would be very happy if the Indians actually turned around and said that he was actually a drug-crazed alcoholic who liked screwing his Indian girlfriends as much as his black slaves. But then again, I don't suppose many of the white gentlemen in those days actually admitted their preferences. Their preferences went further than that. And although we don't need to go into this today, I can assure you that our nations were subjected to shocking harm. The black man was also subjected to enormous degradation. And one degradation that the Indian is very sad and sorry about is that a black man now sits on the throne of the United States. I believe it would have been wiser of the fools that hide behind the Bush organization if they had actually given America back to the red man. I believe we have more rights to govern our own lands than a black man who was actually not born in America, but in Africa. He has an African father and a white mother. And I actually believe if you go into his genealogy, his white mother comes out of the Bush family, which is a very interesting line of genealogy that actually goes through Germany. I believe even touches Switzerland here and there. I think they have a few Saxons behind them and a few Hanoverians and quite a few Swiss families. I believe they're connected also to the English crown, the Dutch crown, the Swedish crown and a few other <coughs> rather heightened names around the world. I think what they don't know though around the world is that this family has been using the Americas as a possibility of moving a lot of very dangerous instruments around the planet. From instruments, I mean, this could be a combine harvester. Um, it could be um, a wheelie bin that you push outside for your rubbish. Or it could be something a little bit more dangerous that we use when we go into battle. And certainly when we battle on the streets of trying to hurt your children so badly that they can no longer function anymore. When they put their dangerous arms on the streets, I don't have to say to you what I think they're using. I'm not going to endanger this woman with this. I won't blame anyone in their present living family. We're just going to talk about the 16, 17 and 1800s, when the same families were actually governing the southern states of America, along with a few of their northern allies and when they were already putting a lot of drugs even onto the streets of countries such as Ethiopia, surprisingly enough. South Africa was also transporting huge amounts of drugs, I believe, through those wagons that were brought in from the north. I think some of the Boers came down from Amsterdam. I have a feeling they were pulling in quite a few of their drugs to take them down to harm some of the very nice Zulu people in the south. But then you know the Zulus are my brothers too, and what an extraordinary breed of mankind they are. They are open, honest, generous, and highly enlightened. I think that is a little bit more of our likeness than those that wear crosses and really don't know what to do with their neighbours, apart from try to harm them if they don't agree with them. We're coming to a close because I know the minutes are running away. I don't know exactly how much longer I have to speak. But I think if the gentleman taping would like to know more, I will speak again. I thank you all for listening and I offer you my humble apologies for anything that I or any of my brethren ever did to any one of you in the past. I offer love and peace.
Thank you. The woman whose name I won't tell for her own safety has some incredible capabilities, of which I only filmed this sequence here, where Little Wolf speaks through her mouth. I know though that all leaders in the world are of pharaonic descent, including the chiefs and medicine men of the First Nations. Therefore this shoe almost killed Little Wolf after the Battle of Little Big Horn in June 1876, where he miraculously turned up right after and just before the battle in which he never participated. Don't trust your leaders, guys and girls, cause they're all pharaonic, and we men are all alike. Omitakuyasim. Look, it looks like a uh, like a medicine man or a, a chief, doesn't it? They're all pharaonic, all our leaders, the chiefs, the presidents, the the kings, the queens, the pharaohs. They all are. Look, and here's the uh, Indian chief. Well, doesn't he look like the pharaoh we just saw before? The same, the same headdress? Well, these are the leaders. I don't say the Indians are pharaohs, I say the leaders are all over in the world. And this is why people lose wars, because they listen to the leaders. Well, it looks like a crown like the other ones in Europe. Now why do you think our leaders want to look different from the rest of the people? Similarly, the medicine men of the Maya, Inca and Aztec Indians told the people that holy bearded men would come from the sea. Then the Spanish conquistadores came with their long beards and butchered them all. Medicine men are the equivalent of the church and priests of Amun, and the chiefs are the aristocracy. Don't listen to them, I tell you. The enemy within is very real all over the world. So conquistadores means the ones who do the conquest. So if the First Nations want to rise up against this tyranny, then don't listen to your chiefs and medicine men. You've already tried that before, well, and look what came out of it. A total disaster. Little Wolf is right though that Obama has Swiss ancestors from Octagon and Mr. Christian Gunther from Bischwiller, Alsace, France proved. This is what the lady said. Remember? So you can read it if you want. Just punch pause. So here we can see Obama's Swiss coat of arms, it says Gutknecht, as his ancestor's name was, is being held up by one of his relatives in Switzerland. Johannes Gutknecht settled down from Bern, Switzerland in Alsace, France in 1720, just after the Thirty Year War, which ended in 1648 when the Swiss Templars from Octogon murdered 95% of the original Gallo-Roman Alsatians, so the Swiss could massively settle down there just as Obama's ancestor did before emigrating to Germantown in Pennsylvania. So here you can see one of his relatives in Switzerland. Hello, Mrs. Obama. So here you can read the whole story again in English. It was in a lot of newspapers especially in the Swiss-German part uh, where all of a sudden they were very proud of it and they even said well we go to Washington and he's our friend well you should see how they treat black people here otherwise if they're not just a uh, um, a president of the United States you know 
as I proved to you in the Pharaoh show and the Octagon series that Switzerland is the biggest base for the Pharaohs. And Obama's Swiss ancestors most certainly helped massacring all the original Alsatians during the 30 year war by the Swiss as he is doing now in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's in the bloodline probably killing is. <laughs>